Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank. Steven, it's nice to have you on the show if you want to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. So my name's Stephen Kane. I'm a professor of planetary astrophysics at the University of California, Riverside. And you were uh, mentioned a little bit off air. We were talking about exoplanets. Um, and your particular interest, you said you had kind of a foot in both camps when it came to uh, the study, Venus and Earth. Now, this... I've talked about and I've mentioned because I think um, it was the main director for NASA talked about how just below is it Venus's atmosphere might be suitable for life. And that was never really I never heard anything like that before. I thought we were going to be more likely living on Mars. And I've kind of hit the topics of space colonization. In my opinion, I mean, it seems cool. I would like to stay on Earth. No offense to anybody out there that wants to. I'm just used to it, man. I don't want to I don't like change a whole lot um, when it comes to like moving homes. That's a mess, not even moving planets. But um, it seems like space colonization is a hard one to kind of talk about that i started realizing that it has been weaponized in a lot of sense and it is kind of just still one long continuous space race yeah yeah it's it's been really interesting seeing the the, the history of this because like you said that the focus has been on mars a lot um and there's a the, there's a lot of historical reasons for that uh i i've been um, studying the history of how ideas about life on other planets have evolved through time. And Mars has been a big one because uh, back in the late 1800s, uh, there, were, there were some prevalent scientists who were, who were providing a lot of what they, they thought was good evidence that there was intelligent life on Mars. And of course, that turned into H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds and they're coming to get us and all this kind of stuff. But with Mars, we figured out... Uh, reasonably early on, not long after those stories uh, were written, that there wasn't really anything like that there because we can see the surface of Mars. It has a very thin atmosphere. Venus, on the other hand, has a very thick atmosphere. And uh, so speculation about life on Venus continued right up until about the mid-60s until we actually went there. And we landed on the surface and we figured out it was just the most hellish place you can possibly imagine. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> but we had to go there and, and figure it out, but, um, uh, but s still we're continuing on, on this trajectory with, with Mars. Now, now Mars has a lot less of a barrier to actually people living in a sustainable way on, on the surface. Venus, the, the surface is a bit of a non-starter. Um, for, for your listeners who, who aren't aware of what the surface of Venus is like, the mean temperature is about 850 degrees Fahrenheit, which I realized last summer is the maximum temperature that my barbecue, the temperature gauge, <laughs> goes up to. So if I put that up to maximum, that's Venus. Um, but it also has the pressure at the surface, which is equivalent to about a kilometer depth in the ocean. So it has this extremely thick atmosphere. Um, but like you said, people have speculated about okay so the surface is is a no-go but what about living in the clouds and i don't know about that i mean i'm like you like <laughs> if i have to move that's a giant pain mm. in the ass um but but the other thing is living on venus you're uh, suspended in the clouds the consequences of a floating city losing altitude are severe and that is no way for anybody to die. <laughs> Let me just say that. It's another Disney right. prediction right there, talking about with Age of Ultron, where that city was falling out of the sky and going to crash into the earth like a giant comet like that knocked out the dinosaurs. Right, yeah, except it would be 100 times worse than that because instead of just falling to earth, you'd be falling essentially into this hellish pit of acid. <laughs> <laughs> so then where does the topic of research go? Because the way that I'm looking at it now, maybe the fascination with Mars is not just an aspect that it's Mars, but maybe it's because it seems like it's the most 
one that we're going to have to do less work on because I think with our idea of inventions, there's more probably focus on propulsion systems rather than work, which I mean, that would go to Venus as well, too, if you have a propulsion system for a city to be up in the sky. But what about terraforming? What about making the planet more habitable for human life in such a sense where we humans change our environment? Let's change that environment or would that maybe throw off an a, a, a unpeating balance on the new planet? Yeah, it's a bit. There's a lot of um, a different slope. thoughts about this, both both scientific and ethical, actually, because uh, the 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 issue of present life on Mars, meaning that it could still exist under the surface in in some state, is such that uh, there is a big push to still not do anything too severe on Mars in case we disrupt an existing ecosystem. And there's uh, been a lot that's been written about that. This is why we spend so much time trying to disinfect everything that we send there, because it's one of the things that we've learned out of this whole planetary exploration program is how hardy bacteria on Earth are in that they're able to survive space and make it to another planet. Um, so we don't want to go there looking for life and actually detect ourselves by accident, you know. Um, so, so there's that. But in terms of terraforming the the, the planet, that is that is an enormous amount of effort for something which in, inevitably may not be sustainable. Because this comes down to um, why I, I I study. I I mentioned that I study Earth and Venus but also study Mars in this as well. You've got these three planets that have had a very different evolutionary process. Earth has obviously remained in a habitable state where we can have surface liquid water. Um, and uh, because surface liquid water has been very important for life on Earth, everything, all life on Earth requires uh, liquid water. And the fact that it's remained in this fairly narrow temperature range that allows that is really interesting. Um, Mars and and Venus have not. And so that's one of the main questions that we need to get a handle on. And the reason that's important for terraforming is because let's just say that we went to Mars and we were able to um, reinvigorate the atmosphere, shall we say. E Elon Musk has, uh, has had this kind of Bond villain plan of setting off a nuke at the poles um, <laughs> to try and put material back into the atmosphere. But, but let's just say that we would do that. Would Mars be able to sustain it? And the, 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 the overarching opinion at the moment is that no, it wouldn't, because there's a reason Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere, and that's because it's small, has uh, relatively low surface gravity, and it just can't hold it. Um, so if you were to terraform Mars, it would be a temporary thing that would require ongoing maintenance. Uh, and that's probably not sustainable. With space colonization, though, do you think that's a, a, a possibility? I mean, I get the preservation of the human species when it comes to, I mean, the fact that we haven't been taken out by an asteroid as it is. I mean, I know we have lasers and stuff to be able to handle those, but for the longest time, there was just other planets, gravitational pools that were taking them. It, it, it was at Venus is the or venus or mercury one of those is the, like our shield or something like that something in a comet almost hit us in october of like 2017 or something like that but venus's gravitational pull pulled it in i mean that that's all it's kind of like if you just stopped breathing god forbid or whatever if you just stop breathing i mean that's a rare chance but it's not out of the realm of possibility and that's kind of like an asteroid heading into earth i mean for the longest time up to the these points where technology started advancing it's kind of like a roll of the dice um in a sense and i think that's with the self-preservation of the human species moving to another planet but man i i, I my I, I've talked to an astroecologist who's talked about like growing, trying to grow plants in hard kind of climates to be able to grow if there's a plant or planet that can't, you know, doesn't have the factors that Earth has to be able to grow like, you know, a healthy. I mean, after a while, you think with enough research into that specific um, study, you're going to get some type of more expertise every single year. See, my focus is like everyone loves the alien topic. It's fun. It really is fun. Um, and I, I, I like to see it progress. It's cool. It, it's awesome to think an uh, 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 extraterrestrial being came here. But at the same time, I don't want to lose funding in the probably the most prime aspects, which comes to sustainability of life when it comes to living on another planet. And that is the astroecology field. That's astrobiology. That's all these types of fields out there that are learning on how we can still 
still survive in a different climate and that climate being a different planet, but it's just not sexy, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. It's uh, so, so so there's a lot of things in what, in what you just said there. It's, um, it's something I think about a lot about my motivation behind what we're doing here. Hold on a second. I'm just going to coffee up a little more. I like how it says adult on your cup. Very apropos. (laughs) So, um, so uh, yeah, as I was saying, I I think about this a lot about what we're doing, which is um, part of the part of it is, of course, this fundamental question: Is there life out there? And this, of course, ties into exoplanets. Uh, And so, when we go to Mars and we think about Venus, and like I said, when we're looking at the difference in Earth, Venus, and Mars, uh, some of that is a lot of it is in the context of, well, why did these planets turn out differently? And what does that mean for planets around other stars? And what does that ultimately mean for whether there's life out there? You know, trying to translate that into a probability, but we're still learning uh, uh, um, about this whole process and uh, the the numbers are still low. And And the sobering fact for me going into this is that we, if we're going to look for answers to these questions, then we have to do so in an agnostic way that such that we're willing to accept that the answer may be that we are the only a, um, intelligent civilization. That, that may be the answer uh, for, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, uh, but if, that, if that's true, then it means that, uh, that rather than focus on the possibility of aliens having visited and that sort of thing, then we really do need to think about the sustainability uh, of our own species and our own civilization and, and what we need to do to, um, to, to make sure that's a long-term plan, you know, rather than, rather than just the, the next 50 years, the next hundred years, and, and, and we'll see how, what, what pans out because, uh, we, we, we may be <laughs> all, all, all the intelligent civilization, and, and I should be clear, you know, a lot of people like to joke, well, you know, we're not really an in- intelligent civilization because look at what we're doing. But um, I, I just stick with the Frank Drake definition of the ability to communicate across space, you know, that, then you can just like call that done. Well, no matter even the destruction, people want to say like the human race is an intelligent, we're, we're doing pretty damn well. Like as much as you can point blame at, you know, a species for destroying or maybe changing a lot of things and maybe ruining some other things, making things go extinct. That's one thing. But the idea that a civilization can create a little device that sits in your pocket that allows you to access information at the touch of your fingertips. I mean, that's, that's not a, a short feat. I mean, you're only progressing. You only get better and better and better it's interesting like i like the evolution of not just society but the evolution of the human species i think that eventually you adapt to the situations and climates that you're in which makes it like i had an idea about colonizing on the moon um my buddy haystack me and him he's a radio astronomer in africa and we're talking back and forth about space colonization he's the one that through the weaponization of it to where it's kind of like threw out my idea a little bit but if you colonize on the moon eventually after a while people go well i don't want to live in a dome my whole entire life i want to go out and explore i'm like do you not think that the human species wouldn't develop oxygen tablets that are able to oxygenate your blood to where you could not have your helmet like you're going to figure out different things to adapt to your new changing climate innovation in humans is probably the most amazing thing that we have besides just our curiosity yeah that's one of the the parts of space travel terraforming so on that i find really really interesting i mean you, you can look at just very simple examples on earth for, for for example i'm sure most people have experienced if you're like driving up a mountain or driving down a mountain your ears pop or your ears get blocked or something like that and part of the reason for that is because the the human ear did not evolutionarily evolve uh to change changes rapid changes in altitude uh you know that that only it it became experienced on a regular basis once we had cars or or means to to change altitude really quickly and so once once we go into really different environments then we're going to find many 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 more of these sorts of cases and like you said uh, there's I'm, i'm sure there's solutions to to many of these uh but just in in general, in terms of going back to what we're saying about the innovation of humanity and uh, and the progress that that we've made, 
I, I think part of the challenge, and, and this is where people get cynical, I guess, is that not so much that we can innovate and we can create things like smartphones and, and, and the internet and so on. It's just that um, uh, sociologically, uh, we have not necessarily evolved to understand and grasp that, that technology on a societal level. And so, uh, I mean, uh, all, all we hear about, uh, especially over the past five years, uh, is about the sociological effects of Facebook and Twitter and, uh, and, and just the internet and social media and how that is changing people's opinions. We're st we still don't fully understand or, or grasp what... Uh, how this is affecting us as a society, which, which I, you know, one of my, one of my theories about uh, the answer to the Fermi paradox, which, um, uh, which is this uh, question that was asked uh, by, by Fermi several decades ago uh, of if there's intelligent civilizations out there, why haven't we heard from them? Or why don't we have any evidence? We, we should have heard something by now. Uh, and one of the answers may be that um, that other civilization invented the internet. <laughs> you know, and, and that that could be the great barrier because, um, or that they inver invented virtual reality and they didn't feel the need to go traveling amongst the stars. You know that they found found other things that occupied their time. Uh, it's going to take some time to to figure out how this is really affecting us as a whole. How, what do you think your biggest fear would be? Um, at least through just like your study of exoplanets and your studying planets in general. I mean, are you pro the space colonization kind of? push forward or do you think that like you're mentioning um i guess our developmentalness i would say of our mentalities in a lot of sense it's more it's a me thinking instead of a we thinking you know if you're having infighting on the internet i really do not want those people going up into another planet just because i don't trust anybody you know there's one person you're in a giant dome or something one person puts a gun to the dome and just goes if someone if i don't get what i want i'm gonna i'm gonna end it all it's like well hang on a second like we can't have people like that we need to have like you know astronauts need psychological tests and they need all these types of things unless you're bezos sending william shatner up there for no apparent reason um but you need to have these kind of things that get kind of classified to make sure you're equipped to deal with it i mean those psychology tests that they do when you have like a therapist in the little mars camp dome thing that they have and then they have like a bunch of people to see if their personalities will conflict and if they can resolve the conflict by themselves you need to have conversation you need to have cooperation as well too and right now i don't think society is ready to deal with that and i don't think we have been for a long time i think it's because maybe it is the devices i mean maybe that's our undoing in such a sense the internet i think it's a powerful tool but you also don't incentivize learning to be fun. I didn't know learning was fun until I was able to chat with someone like yourself and be able to really ask the questions that only I would ask because you, you soak up information better that way. And I feel like the world doesn't really have that option. Yeah. So uh, I remember a few years back, there was actually a survey on for just for the general public, as I recall, uh, as to who would be willing to go to Mars, you know, if you had an opportunity to be the first person, you're going to be the first person to live in Mars, but it's a one-way trip. And for at least the first several years, you'll be on your own. And, uh, and believe you me, whatever internet you'll have will suck, right? Because <laughs> there's no infrastructure for that there. And it's, it takes four minutes, even when Mars and Earth are at their closest, it takes four minutes for that light travel time. Um, yeah, you, you it'd have to be extremely psychologically robust. And, uh, and so that gets back to this, this, this whole thing that, um, uh, that I, I think a lot of the focus is on the physical effects of space travel or sustained periods on another planet. Um, but I, I don't think people think enough about the mental health uh, because it, mental health and physical health are, are intricately related uh, and if you lose one you're going to lose the other so uh so the the mental health would have to be extremely robust uh I, i'm not sure i could do it uh in fact i can probably say with almost 100 percent confidence i couldn't do it <laughs> but i i could not go to to mars and you know do a whole mark watney just hanging out for for a couple of years waiting for something to happen i think it, it's going to 
if if it was a situation like that where they send one person up into space like how um that movie the martian kind of went it had to be someone that really revels in isolation really kind of grows in that aspect on um, balancing out with your thoughts you would look to the people who would be the societal outcast the people who have learned to evolve and get comfortable with those things have you ever seen the movie clash of the titans oh yeah yeah you know when hades said i learned to pray off their fear while you learn to live off their love like that's what it is that the outcasts are the people that have learned to comfort and find comfort in that silence and that isolation which might be the most resilient people i think there's a quote that like uh a true sign of a healthy person is a person that isolates to themselves or something like that because they're equipped to deal with and it's just it, it goes a little bit longer than that but that's i mean it's true in an aspect i spend a lot of my time alone not because i don't have friends it's just because i don't i don't want to I don't know. I like thinking by myself, that deep contemplation, that silence really can ev evoke a lot of emotion out of a person, help you deal with a lot of the things as well, too. I think that's the same thing with space. Those are going to be people that are going to be able to test. You need a, you need an Elvis. You need someone who's going to step in every single pothole and take that risk and take that charge in and give you a template to work off of. So you can develop and adapt on your own to where you can make it to where millions of people can live on another planet and be able to function perfectly fine. Yeah. Well, <laughs> a, a funny way of thinking about, uh, about this and a glass is half full way of looking at the pandemic the last couple of years is that uh, it's given us opportunity to have a, essentially a two year training program for isolation for living on Mars. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, uh, th that has uh, r revealed a lot of results in, in in that regard, we have seen men mental health drop dramatically uh, during the the pandemic. But um, but I I think that 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 there is this um, natural sociological response of being around other other people that I think a lot of the time uh, we don't appreciate, and many of us didn't appreciate until the last two years happened. Uh, for example, uh, it, within the University of California system, we went back to in person classes just this past week. Uh, so the first four weeks of the academic year we did virtually uh, due to Omicron. And, um, and so for the first class on Tuesday, uh, I provided a hybrid option uh, for people who didn't feel comfortable, but almost everybody showed up uh, to class. And I could feel the energy in the room of everybody just so excited to, to, to see other people again. And uh, and so it does make me wonder, you know, th th things like that about how how equipped we are to go into these deliberately put ourselves into these sustained periods of isolation for something like going to Mars, uh, and uh, and whether we could adequately vet for that. Uh, I I bet that if if somebody were to be the first person on Mars and they spent like two years there, and then another person. Um, uh, showed up as the next part, part of the program uh, that they probably would just be deliriously happy in a way that they couldn't imagine to see that second person show up, yeah. <laughs> even if they're the most robust sort of, you know, it's kind of like old retired people who don't have anybody that they live with. And then they see a person, they're usually yapping your ear off for a couple of hours because they literally have no one to talk to. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I guess it would be the same as that. But do you think that this leads into like, let's say, you know, everyone being for the past two years and then finally returning back to class, they kind of miss that social interaction. They kind of forget all the bad stuff. It's kind of like graduation goggles in school. Once you graduate, you're like, oh, I miss all those people. No, you didn't. You didn't miss them because when you go, you remember remember all the bad times of uh you know just going through school but you right what you're doing right now is you're cherry picking the good times because you're getting nostalgic over those emotions what about the idea if the internet was shut down how many people are checking and trying to refresh their connection over and over again until it goes back up i wonder if especially you're seeing a rising increase i would say in people doing their own education or their own at least searching up or googling um in a sense especially when they're older and they don't go to college anymore or they're not in high school those people are trying to find out their own information listening to more podcasts as an educational source too it leads into an open i guess access for open science which i've seen that hashtag on twitter a couple of times um which scientists like yourself or other researchers out there as well too in any type of field are 
able to just to talk to the basic public or common public. I mean, I don't like the hashtag citizen science. I'm like, hang on a second. Hang on. Just because they threw in a perspective that you don't really you haven't seen yet doesn't give them the right to be a citizen science. It could be a toilet Googler, you know, but I think it leads into curiosity. And I think that's one of the biggest foundational aspects of our human species is this curiosity, this wonderment for more, which has us going to the moon, which has us going to Mars, which has us leading down another pathway. I mean, hopefully soon. I mean, I don't know if it's space colonization first or if it's learning that there's another dimension. NASA, I know, put out like a weird article and then everyone's kind of like looked at it and be like, no, there's no other dimensions or parallel universes that we know of. And I'm like, but how do we know? Such a weird thing to have to say, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But it, it, that's the thing, though. It's like we only know what we know. Is that do you think that's a possibility, like another dimension or another type of rift? I mean, the UFO community always talks about, well, aliens are two dimensional. They have they've mastered 2D space. And it's like, ah. Uh, yeah, so my, my feeling about that is that that's so far down the rabbit hole of speculation. Uh, I, I don't, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't investigate that at, at all. all. All possibilities should be on the table and, and open for discussion. But I think there's enough interesting things going on in the real universe <laughs> yeah. that, that, that we can observe. Uh, many things that we don't understand about it that there's plenty of things to keep us busy there so so when i see that 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 kind of discourse happening it it feels a little bit like um uh uh ignorance talking to ignorance in, in respect to the amount that we don't know about that subject um that's my perception of it um but uh but but go back to what you say saying about people learning oh, one of the good things to come out of the pandemic, uh, I would say is like people do have a lot more access uh, to just material because people have been producing a lot more of it. They've been making it more accessible. Um, uh, things like your podca podcast and other things that people can listen to. It's just, it's become abundantly clear that there is a real desire even going forward once we come out of the pandemic um, for people to have access to, to all of that. Uh, so so that, that's a really good thing. Well, it's like my theory of why people probably get interested in the government stuff is that you're you want to know what's behind the curtain. I mean, that's same thing with research as well, too. Nobody just wants to feel like they, they have less information than anybody else. Everyone wants to feel like they're in on the know. And sadly, it's all Twitter or social media is really sending to your face is the political stuff. And it's like, well, what about the space stuff? Because I was on NASA's website. They have a Twitter for exoplanets. They have a Twitter for all this type of stuff. Where I'm like, hang on a second. I thought NASA was just like the, the blue shirt logo type thing. Like, I just thought they, they'll publish an article here or you'll see Bill Nelson get up on stage. He needs a glass of water or something. But he'll start talking and letting people know that aliens exist. That's cool. Well, what else is there that I don't know? And you realize they're searching into things and working on different projects that you would have never even thought of. I mean, that telescope that went all the way up into uh, space, that's new everyone's talking about. There's a lot of people that are like, that's cool, but what about aliens? It's like, I get you're interested in aliens, but you see the foundational footsteps of how society is progressing right now. Like before, it's going to space was an idea. Now we're sending things up there at whenever we want. We have a rocket that now lands. Whether that's Elon, whether you like him or you don't, that's pretty impressive considering that a year ago everyone was laughing at him and now they're doing it. Like you see, as I've asked someone before, what do you think about moon being living on the moon? And they've just laughed like that's not going to be in my lifetime. How do you know, man? What you know is that like, OK, well, tomorrow we might have the iPhone 17. Like it's advancing so quick. And you really have to take note of it because I feel like people are walking around on autopilot. They're interested in what they're interested in, but they're missing all the crucial things like, wait, we, we, we landed on Mars. When, when did we land on Mars? It's like you were watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> just turn on the TV. Mars has just happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, um, you know, with, with respect to the whole NASA hiding aliens, uh, I remember a few years back, I was giving a talk at a. I think it was a school. And so, yeah, because there's a bunch of kids. And one of them asked me a question, is NASA hiding information about aliens? And I said, well, let me answer it this way. If NASA were hiding aliens at Area 51 or wherever, 
how would I answer that question? And the kid said to me, well, you'd say that you weren't hiding anything. And I said, if, if NASA wasn't hiding any information, how would I answer it? And he thought, and he said, oh, I guess you'd say you weren't hiding anything. And I said, right, the answer would be the same both ways. And so that doesn't give you, because whichever answer I give you, you're just going to reinforce your own pre-existing yeah. idea. Like, oh, he only said he's not hiding anything because he's hiding something, you know? So, so, so it's, it's very difficult for, to, to, to win in that, in, in that situation. Um, but, uh, but yeah, with, with regards to, to the advancement in, in spaceflight and, and the, the work that Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, Elon Musk have been, been doing you know it's, it's really like you said things could change at any time right so um and what's re really interesting we know whenever we look back at the the moon landings and, and in the 60s when kennedy was really pushing uh pushing this whole thing and then nixon took that over and we went to the moon and um the budget for nasa was of course a lot higher back then <laughs> because there was a political aspect to that you know competing with the russians and so on that that really fueled that um and uh it's what's really interesting to me is when you look at the science fiction shows from back in the 60s and the 70s it, like it, go back to the old black and white ones they're portraying in the mid 70s would be landing spaceships on planets all throughout the solar system yeah. and other solar systems in the 70s you know that their mystical future um and so here we are <laughs> in in the 2020s and we and humans still haven't gone beyond the 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 lunar orbit um but uh clearly what has happened is that commercial enterprise has is rapidly overtaking uh the the will of governments to progress the space program and while ever that continues um with the resources available to to, to these companies who knows what we'll see in our lifetime? Who knows? I mean, things have been changing so rapidly lately. Well, maybe it's not even the idea, like I mentioned earlier about, it's just not sexy enough. Maybe it's the factor of like, there's just too many categories. There are so many classifications in research. I think there's over like a hundred fields that are subcategories of psychology. There's even more in other categories as well, too, of other academical fields. That just makes it harder because now instead of everyone wanting more funding, you're having people that are like, I don't want them to get funding. I want the funding. Thing. And it's like, well, hang on a second. We got to look at the advancement of, you know, what money do we have? We can't just take it out of everything. And then everyone wants to try and turn into an accountant that wants to budget the, uh, uh, wants to find a way to, I guess, work with our budget. And it's like, I want to see a progression of space and I want to see a, a progression of science. Honestly, if you ask my honest opinion, I would really want to explore the oceans a little bit more because I'm afraid they got a kraken or something that's sleeping at the bottom. Um, <laughs> at least I'm hoping. But what I, I honestly, think that we can really hit a major stride in innovation if we hopped off of the political train for a little bit but everyone i mean the military is not going to fund it unless it's going to be able to be like the question is uh can we weaponize it it's like do ah, you want to weaponize a telescope eh, i mean well, you know just in case we need to you know fire off a missile or something it's like okay well you don't want the military to get involved because then eventually that person's going to have a say i mean they're your sponsor they're giving you the money to do what you want to do um, that's the, one of the biggest problems i've heard from my buddy haystack um is that the observatory telescope that they have there that it's like a giant laser that shoots off into the sky he's like there's a thing in the contract that talks about it can start wildfires as well too and that was a fear in a lot of aspects that these lasers could do that um but it's always like some type of sub clause that's fit to the narrative of the person that funds you that leads to billionaires i don't want scientists talking to billionaires like hey you're going up into space right bezos you mind if i uh shoot my project your way first one's going to sound great wow that you can make sustainable life on another planet that's that's very interesting you know what here's a billion dollars gives them a billion dollars next person comes up hey i can do this all right yeah but can you also modify it to where it has a giant lettering of my name on the side so people know that i'm a part of this then that goalpost keeps moving to eventually now these scientists are 
talking to billionaires for funding when they should be talking to their institutions. Your institutions should be wanting you to progress forward. And no matter if it's stigmatized or not, you can't base your decisions off of a minority, uh, a, uh, a minority voice on social media that's saying, oh, we're going to walk out of Harvard or we're going to walk out of this. Well, then the, the school doesn't want to get in trouble on social media or the people that are funding the school to pull out. So they're not going to let you research the thing that you want to research into. Yeah, that you know what you described there is the number one thing that uh, that really worries me about commercial enterprise leading the way on space exploration. Um, because there's, uh, as you know, when the whole uh, recent uh, Branson, Bezos, Musk, you know, send, sending things up, there was a lot of negative publicity that they they got out of that. I, I think that they were expecting to be hailed as pioneers like the first aviators or something like that and it didn't work out that way and um uh the the big thing there was uh the difference between we did that as opposed to they did that because i mean if you look at the the epitome of this in many ways which is the 1969 uh, apollo 11 moon landing uh that was a really world unifying moment even though it was a u.s-led effort the, the the whole world really got behind that but especially over the last couple of years when we've seen this huge disparity uh, in, in the wealth gap and that the, the rich people are just um, uh, using their money to send rockets into space. It's having all kinds of consequences, um, one of which is uh, people asking even more this question, you know, why are we, what a waste of money? Why are we doing that when there's problems on, on earth? And, and there's a lot of answers to that, but, uh, but, like I was saying, the main concern is uh, space policy is something that should be decided at an international level and decisions made about what goes up, how space should be used. Uh, but if, if governments start to, or international treaties uh, don't take the lead on that, then commercial enterprise will. And that means that they will set the policies that benefit their own business and the, and the growth of their own companies. And then that becomes very concerning because it turns into, like, like you said, um, that you have somebody who's making not even a subjective opinion, but, uh, but uh, making decisions based on how it benefits their business model uh, on how we should be pursuing science. And that is a pathway that could, can potentially be problematic down, down the road. Do you uh, think that there's a... I guess not really, uh, I would say an unspoken space race going on right now. Like we have Elon going to Mars or we have, uh, we're going to Mars just in general, the people are, at least in the States. If that, let's say it's not real time, but let's say an estimate of like, let's say it takes four years. Do you think that another nation is trying to find another maybe planet out there to be able to go to? And let's say that takes five years. It's like, I don't want, I don't want to see earth in the center or I'm not saying it's in the center of the universe. I'm just saying like in the example I'm using, it's here and then everyone's firing off space rockets in different planets to go colonize on different planets because that's going to divide us even more. And that's not really what we need. We need a unification to be able to go to one planet, to another planet, to another planet together in kind of a, a sense of harmony. But at this point, everyone wants to be the first on a new planet. My fear is that when you're the first on a new planet, you end up becoming the toll booth owner. Now, everyone that comes to that planet is going to look to you because you've built a house already and they want to find out how they can do the same thing now you're the president of a new planet and that becomes an issue i think before we like we were talking about earlier i think before you leave this planet you should probably have a better balance with all the nations in a sense you know we have a united nations for instance that i mean it gets the job done in a sense but i still hear a lot of infighting that goes on with that but you need an intergalactic one because now you got to understand this and that's why the alien topic is interesting because that's a way to unify people if you have another thing that you can't understand it's like 9-11 when that happened, everyone kind of dropped their crap and they were like, this is an issue that we need to fix. You need something like that. And that would be aliens, an alien type thing. Are they going to harm us? Are they going to help us? I have no clue. But either way, it's going to cause people to wake up for a second and realize that the fact that they can't get a Starbucks Frappuccino because the price has increased. This is a little bit bigger than that. Well, actually, it might be at the same level in their head, but at the same time, it's it's a bigger issue that might actually unite a lot of people. I think we need that unification, not just with one nation, but with multiple nations. I don't know how that gets done. I have no solutions to even 
try and take down that Hindenburg. But that is one that is very, very complicated. And it's very, very complex when you look at the grand scale of, do you care about humanity's survival? Yeah, I mean, that that, that can be really helpful. Of, of course, what, what you're describing about this external threat uh, is the premise behind oh, one of my favorite graphic novels, Watchmen, uh, which has been... <laughs> Dr. Manhattan. Yeah, yeah Do- Dr. Manhattan, um, or Giant Squid, depending on which version of the story that you've seen. Um, but, uh, but my hope, uh, and I guess many people's hope, is that our... Uh, our imminent threat that affects everybody uh, is climate change. And that that's something you would hope that would be a world unifying effort. Uh, And it's not like there's no premise for this because we saw this in the eighties with the hole in the ozone layer, which was above the, uh, above the Antarctic. Uh, This was back in the eighties and it was, and it was seen primarily caused by chlorofluorocarbons and aerosols and things like that. And so the world summits got together at that time and they said, all right, we need to cut out this production and it worked. They, they solved the problem and, and the, and the uh, hole in the ozone in that region has been largely restored. Since then we've seen a giant politicization of climate science uh, and and how that's affecting the planet and affecting all of us such that we can no longer band together on, on this sort of thing. And that's why um, it, that there's a lot of people who are very cynical about this now. There was that recent uh, movie by Leonardo DiCaprio called Don't Look Up, which kind of parodied uh, how even if you had it were to have an asteroid on its way to hitting the earth, then you'd just get you know, people on the left or the right arguing as to whether it's a conspiracy from the other side of the aisle. You know, it it, it um, it's 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 very discouraging to see that we can't unify behind something as simple as uh, as as climate science. So when it comes to aliens, you know, <laughs> it, it's it, w- would it help to to know that there is a um, like if we were to detect that there is some kind of a giant spacecraft hanging out just beyond the orbit of Neptune, you know, not necessarily on its way to invade us, but, but we've identified it. It's a giant mega spacecraft. Um, It'd be really interesting to see how people would react to that uh, and um, get, get really worried and, and see, see the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Defense Department essentially take over NASA and and uh, pour all all that money into it. You'd have your uh, cult believers that stand out there waiting for the comet to take them to Bebop or whatever it's called that they go to. But then you would have people that would be in fear and want to bring up their guns and try and get aggressive. Um, I think it's interesting because there's two pathways there. One, if they're here to help you and they're going to try and help you evolve. Two is the fact that they're here to attack and that unites everybody. Either way, you're getting a unification amongst people to deal with the bigger issue at hand. Now, climate change, that might be one that could really unify a lot of people. The only issue is is that it's so divided because there's a lot of sides on both parts. The fact that they have been hyping it up for a very long time. They weren't very real with people back in the day. Um, They're still not really real with a lot of information, not just climate change, but a lot of stuff now. That's the whole thing. Like I uh, reached out to get a presidential candidate or, you know, Bernie Sanders, whoever. I don't, I'm not political. Like when it comes to the aspect, I have a side. I'm more about who's like, do I generally can talk to and realize that they actually might be a good person for the thing. You got to put your crap out on front, man. You got to if you're giving me all the good stuff, I really want to hear the bad stuff, too, because it, it's going to help me weigh my options here. The thing is, is that nobody wants to tell you about your bad stuff. And that's a lot with these problems that go on. Nobody wants to let you know that, oh, there's this, but the world's going to die tomorrow if we don't fix climate change. So electric cars, it's like, OK, well, is it going to die tomorrow? Because it's tomorrow and I'm freaking still here. So now you're lying to me. It, it, in a sense, it's a slow progress. We were talking about before the mental and the physical you don't notice when you have back pain until you have back pain, then eventually you get used to it to where you forget about the back pain because you're always used to that pain. You don't know what normal's like anymore. That's what I'm saying is you eventually get used to the slow changes. That's why aliens, if you see a giant creature in front of you, it's going to cause people to be like, holy crap. Now, if you saw the ozone layer split in like an actual physical, you get to see a giant crack in the sky and fire starts spewing out. You're going to have people, you know, getting rid of their diesel trucks and doing whatever they possibly can to make sure they can reduce their carbon footprint. But 
the way I see it is that life is not really in a sense of trying to eliminate the damage you've done, but it's trying to do as less damage as you possibly can do. Cause the minute you're born, you're doing damage technically to the planet, whether it's good for society or not, you're just living, you're eating off of the planet. You're changing the environment a little bit. You're doing a little bit of damage. The way you can do it is by minimizing it as much as possible to where we can actually work together to realize the risks that we are causing in some sense, climate change. And in other sense, just other major kind of halting of progress of society in a sense. Maybe that's a far. Yeah. So this is a, um, the, the way I think about this, and this goes back to my one of my primary research areas of planetary habitability. Like I said, like they're looking at the differences between Earth and Venus, why they turned out differently. And the, and the way I approach that problem is if you list out all the various differences between Earth and Venus and and Venus is often referred to as Earth's twin. And the, the only real reason for that is because they're the same size, you know, but they're different in just about every other way. And so there's many differences between them. And so you list out all of these differences. Um, they're obviously different distances from the sun, but they're also different um, uh, rotation rates and different magnetic fields and all that kind of stuff. You list them all out and you think, okay, what are the primary factors that have influence their change through time and what are the what are the more minor effects and i i think about climate change in in the same way in the sense that when we look at things like um uh the 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 carbon emissions and the overall carbon footprint uh and you look at the the major effects and you look at something for example uh air travel uh so um uh, I, I know that there are a number of people, I personally know a number of people who no longer fly because they don't want that carbon footprint. But the total, uh, uh, for, from what I read, the, the total percentage uh, of the global carbon footprint that is contributed by all air travel, including commercial and freight, uh, is about 2%, which, may, which means that e even if all, let's just say that where scientists were having a conference because this comes all up, up all the time now in science. Oh, I don't want to fly to this conference because even if all scientists stop traveling um, and scientists are a very small fraction of the total population, then the, then the impact on the carbon footprint essentially would be approximately zero. It would have zero effect. Right. So I tend to look at things like that. And it's, it's like, okay, so that's, that's interesting from a, help help me sleep better at night point of point of view but it doesn't actually help from a what's going to save the planet point of view what is going to save the planet and then it's of course you start to look at industry and you know like uh, entire countries that are pumping out um uh more carbon into the atmosphere than many other countries combined i mean those are the sorts of things that that need to change and so when when you see people focusing on well you know i i i drive a hybrid and it's like well that that that's cool but you're still gonna die along with the rest of us you know <laughs> the double the double thumbs up got me on that one when you're like that's cool that got me uh no, it's funny because I get into a little bit of it. I'm not, I'm not a vegan and I'm honestly not even a meat eater. I usually eat like fish a little bit, but I, I have like a, a digestive thing to where I usually just do shakes, um, like protein shakes and stuff like that. And, um, I always get into an argument where they say, oh, it's cow farts that raise uh, all the greenhouse gases. I'm like, you notice the graphs that you look at when it says cow farts and it's at the top. Do you notice what they're comparing it to? It's such things that don't even make a difference. If you honestly think that cow farts are polluting more than a coal power plant or some type of thing, you're not, you, you understand none of these studies are matching them up to industries or businesses. And they go, what? And they start looking at it and they go, I get, I mean, I still, I see the chart number, the bar graph, the cow ones all the way up. It's like, yeah, but look what the side ones are. They're not industry stuff, but why would an industry show you their biggest flaw? That's why they, no, nobody's going to halt production. Society has to keep going forward. And the more people that are alive, the more that people keep doing more things, they have to keep production up. That's the thing is that that's the biggest issue when it comes to climate change as well, too, is that there's so many factors out there. But one of the leading top ones is the fact that we don't have a renewable source that we're using beneficially. We're using fossil fuels, which in a, in a sense, I mean, you have a large amount of it as well, too. They always say it's going to run out, but it's start you start wondering, like, how much, though? You know, like you've been saying that for like a 50, 100 years. 
Yeah, and I, I think another one of the, the problems with um, uh, convincing people that this is something that we should all be unifying behind uh, is just people get very cynical, not just about the political uh, side, which is really important um, if, if something like that does become uh, perceived as just you being used to score political points against the opposition, then obviously that's really bad. But people also start to get concerned about, oh, the, people have an invested interest in saying that climate change is a real problem because it benefits their business. So, for example, uh, somebody's going to make money out of this, uh, you know, the, the, the hybrid car industry, renewable energy. And that's true. They're going to make money out of it. Um, uh, and, and but it can be difficult. Uh, I find it difficult as well to to, to pass or, or to separate out these different pieces. The same discourse comes up all the time when we're talking about the pandemic. Oh, the pharmaceutical companies are making money out of this. But but then the line of reasoning goes down this pathway. Pharmaceutical companies are making money out of this. Therefore, you know that the, there's all these problems with the vaccine, or that the pandemic is overblown, or things like that. Um, so. It, it can be difficult to separate those, those out. One doesn't necessarily imply the other. Yes, somebody's making money. That, that is true. Yeah. But it doesn't, doesn't mean that it's, it's wrong. We just need to um, uh, be able to somehow bring the pure science back to the forefront that hasn't already been filtered through a company or a politician uh, so that um, the public is more exposed to what they can more properly believe is an unbiased view. So this is my own example I've kind of created through the show, but I think the word science is going to end up turning into like how we look at lockdown and quarantine. I mean, they're the same thing, 100%. But why does one sound like you're a good person and the other one sound like you're being sent to prison? Lockdown sounds like there's bars on the windows, but quarantine, you get a uh, an A-plus sticker on your shoulder. I mean, in a sense, what, two weeks is the time difference? That was the time difference, but you're still being stuck and confined to a space. It's the same word, just the way you say it. It's always the sales pitch. I mean, when I, for me, I want to be at a table of people that don't all agree with me, but there's other varying views. I like that conspiracy person. And the reason why I entertain them so much is because, thank God, someone's thinking outside the box to something that makes me go, what did you just say? Like, that's that's interesting to me. But when I see what really hit me was when Biden had the electric car conference where he invited to all these car companies to talk about getting electric cars to being to usher in for like 2024 or something like that. He didn't invite Elon. And it was because Elon and him didn't or Elon didn't agree to the terms that Biden wanted to represent in the new bill that was being passed. And I go, see, that's where we start seeing like the kind of like the inner workings of the interconnections of the corporate world, in a sense, where I start wondering, like, that's probably a lot of our issues today. A lot of stuff is like really, really connected. I've heard amazing research papers, but they weren't tied to institutions. They were people that lost their Ph.D. or decided, you know, they lost funding from their school or their school put out a research um, grant whatever to them for them to be able to explore their scientific whatever field that they were going after or their research that they were going after just didn't like it based on a societal issue that's very very scary because then you're having them turn to people like myself or someone to give them a platform to talk about these issues they need to be talked about with their institutions these shouldn't be uh scientists being like i need to get on every single podcast why is that? Because nobody at my institution will listen to me. Well, that's not fair. Your institution should be listening to you, whether you're they think you're insane or not. You need to have your ideas expressed in a form because you could say something that could actually change a lot of things. And that's what I don't like is the dismissal. It's the same thing of why I had to clarify of like just eating shakes instead of eating meat or a plant diet. Because if you say you don't eat you're not vegan. They assume you're a meat eater. If you say you're not a meat eater, they assume you're a vegan. It's like, no, there's a balance in everything, but you guys can't dismiss each other over the simplest stuff like this. Yeah. So one of the um, great quotes I really like is the, the way in which to uh, remove bad ideas is not to silence them. It's to create better ideas. Uh, and, and so that means that you're always having a conversation. All ideas are on the table. And through discussion, we will figure out which is the right way forward. Uh, and so that should should be, um, isn't always, but should be the, the fundamental behind 
the academic model and academic institutions, which is that uh, all these ideas are on the table and they're open to discussion. Well, even like with Avi Loeb, him speaking out, talking about it's from a, the Omoomoa is a comet from a lost civilization or some type of like, we're just a, something that came across it, like an ant that just came across a water bottle or something like that. I mean, his, even though he's getting a lot of criticism over that, he's being attacked by his colleagues and stuff. You start looking at an aspect of like, how many people are afraid to say something because they're afraid of how it's going to be reflected or how it's going to be looked. It's kind of self censorship, but now it's taken into academia, a person who might have an idea of an invention or a new type of study, or maybe exploring into dark matter or something like that. Can't raise their hand to say what they want to say because they just heard a bunch of people crack jokes like that. Really that it's like, well, that person's now not having a voice and they're afraid to voice it. You should have people. It should be like Wall Street where everyone's yelling across the table to each other. Like, how much did you invest? How much did you invest? Like, you need that with ideas so people can get a giant kind of census of what everybody's thinking. What's your mindset like? Let's talk about this. And that's how ideas evolve. And that's how we progress. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it, so for uh, an extra piece of some of these topics, like for example, Avi's uh, work on Amomo, uh and the explanation that um, that like here's a here's a an explanation that doesn't require invoking extraterrestrial life or or anything like that. Um, it, there's a, a feeling that uh, we can suffer from alien fatigue or or um, we, we ref sometimes refer to this when we're talking about exoplanets and the search for life on other planets, uh, th this concept of, of, um, of exoplanet fatigue. And what that means is if you make too many announcements to the public about something which could be a planet that might host life, for example, um, then, but, but you don't really have any evidence of it. It just could be. Like there's there's this uh, area of ambiguity that that idea could fit into. Uh, if you do that too many times, then the public starts to get jaded about it. And so when you do eventually actually find life on another planet, uh, that the public will say, "Well, wait a minute, I thought we did that ten years ago." You know, <laughs> there's there's too too many of these press releases, and so that's what I've seen levied as 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 some of the um at the criticism behind if you I, if you're too quick to to say that now this is aliens and and but like you said, I mean it it certainly should be put out there uh, as uh, as a possibility, but um, if you push that forward as well we don't know what it is uh it has these properties that are consistent with, with aliens and so that's something that that we should consider uh yes but in parallel with all all of the other possibilities that's what i meant by back burner and he snapped at me and i was like oh that's a wrong choice of words <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, but I, I, I think uh, if you're going to take a general consensus, I would say, of the poll of the population, do you think more people think that we're not as advanced as we think we are? Or do you think more people are we are more advanced than we think we are? You mean with respect to uh, other potential alien civilizations? No, with just a poll on our human advancement, I would say like there's there's some people like myself. Oh. They say the government has tech that's 20 years advanced. I remember when I was talking about the alien thing, I was like, that could be propulsion systems or some type of thing that a lot of people don't know about or a weather phenomena. I definitely think amount of like global changes that happen. You see mirages. What's to say this isn't a mirage or some type of thing that's messing with our heads a little bit, our eyes at least in a sense. But I don't know. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I would bet that most people and perhaps in an overwhelming way would, uh, would think that we are more advanced than common knowledge uh, than is released to the public. Uh, and I think we've seen a lot of that from the past two years, once again, you know, going back to what's happened over the past two years with, with the pandemic, because, because a lot of the discourse is uh, being about, well, was this released from a lab? And, uh, <laughs> and, and the funny thing about that discourse is that it just keeps going backwards and forwards on 
people like the the the, the who and the cdc has said because i'd say no 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 it didn't come from a lab but then later on they'd say well actually it uh, you know and and that has validated the the feelings of a lot of people because most people didn't weren't even really aware that there were labs that were doing this kinds of research but now it turns out that there are and that they can have these uh, cases uh, where they accidentally release something in, in, into the environment. And so I th think even that case has been a lot of validation of people's um, uh, conspiracy theories of, aha, I knew it, you know, that sort of thing. And so in that, if, if that's true, then what else could be true? You know, it kind of like <laughs> opens Pandora's box. Of I, I was a big supporter of that, um, that it came from a lab. Uh, I remember when you couldn't say it and then the narrative switched to where you can't say it because they started investigating it and said that it might have been a person who was infected with it that worked at the lab. And you start seeing like the dodgy kind of thing of like, you just don't want to say it's them because as soon as you even put out an article saying it's them, you saw how mad they got at us, like they were going to cut off ties to us, which I mean, honestly, I don't really, I don't want to persecute anybody for anything. I just want to know the truth of it because you can't have these things go for so long without being discovered of what it is because then you end up with a 9-11 where you have people saying that you know we need to know all the unclassified stuff the mk ultra jfk time heals pain personally but it does not help when you're trying to find the answer to something the longer you wait the more lost the message gets and that's kind of i guess obvious kind of understanding of what this uh this thing from a lost civilization is that if you don't work on it now, you're not going to be able to figure it out in the next 50 years. The more time you wait, the longer the message gets blurred. And I mean, that's a good point in itself too. For me, I just feel like um, probably I would land in the population of people that think we're definitely people are really underestimating how advanced we are in a lot of aspects of things. I mean, the power of these AI algorithms and stuff, you're really seeing kind of take off in this new, I guess, this new year in general. I just, I think we're definitely got tech that needs to be, it's going to be coming out in the next year or so where you're going to be like, wow, I didn't know we were doing that at all. Yeah. Well, this, you know, this comes up in astronomy all the time because we're trying to design d detectors, um, for, for use in astronomy to measure very, very faint objects, maybe galaxy, uh, other galaxies, uh, or be able to design these detectors for use in spacecraft. So for example, when we send spacecraft to the outer solar system, where a uh, light is a real problem because everything's so faint, it's so far away from the sun. And so they need to develop new technology in order to be able to take clean images and send them back to the earth all that sort of stuff that that that's happening within the scientific communities but then occasionally you become aware that the defense department actually solved those problems 20 years ago and they just didn't tell anybody and so, and so um uh, th this has come up a couple of times that i've seen where you'll have something like an infrared detector which uh, maybe is uh, classified or used on an abrams tank or something like that and and uh in, in astronomy we're years behind trying to de develop that technology for use in our science, uh, whereas it's already been done. We just didn't have access to it because uh, it, it, it's owned by the Defense Department. So that that frequently seems to be the case when it when it comes to that kind of technology. It's weird how people will overestimate their bank account, but they won't un or they'll underestimate the amount of problems that they have when they're explaining something. You know what I'm talking about? Like people, it's weird what we choose to hype up and what we choose not to tell people. Like it's to me, that's just fascinating. If someone's exploring, I don't care if it's about you're able to grow a plant in the middle of the Sahara Desert that shouldn't be there. If you can grow an oak tree, I want to hear about that. That's something that should get front page news, in my opinion. But you see them on what's the biggest tabloids that, uh, the public wants now oh rihanna's pregnant it's like okay that's cool and all like i'm happy for them but at the same time what's the human race going to be happy about when we do end up going to another planet are we ready for that yet you know what i mean there's why these questions are out there there's why we're talking about skepticizing are we ready yet we can't get over our own problems but in a sense is the technology ready to take us there um i honestly think in my opinion before you put on the suit you should make sure your mind can take you there first yeah, yeah, like we're like we're saying the the whole mental health aspect of space travel, I think is still in many ways unexplored, uh, and 
and, and we'll find out when we go to these places like when we do eventually send someone to mars and i think we will uh it's it's difficult to say at this point how soon that will be uh because things just seem to be getting pushed back and pushed back um they need to vet their astronauts though buzz aldrin talking about there's a water on the moon and an obelisk on mars like nasa better be doing a better vetting process you got who's that one lady that uh drove 900 miles to go attack her ex or oh yeah i remember that from a few years back she, oh, come on like that when you go up into space when you come back you ain't right 100 percent. like someone needs to do like a psychology test on people be able to figure out what that is well, it could be argued that that the kind of person who's willing to live in isolation on another planet is actually the kind of person who probably doesn't fit into normal society. The outcast. They have some ab abnormality that might seem really weird. And so uh, maybe we should be looking specifically at the, I was going to say sociopaths. That's probably too harsh. <laughs> Part of a way of putting it. <laughs> Send them somewhere else where they can't hurt anybody. Um, but uh but yeah there's there's got to be something quite quite unique about the the, the people who are, who are able to do that it's as just well the, as willing we've all had those moments you're driving around in a parking lot looking for a spot but there's no spots available and you're like i wish i was on another planet when no one else existed like we've all had those thoughts <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah 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 for sure and 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 um this period for the last couple of years has been the best thing that has happened to many people who are just give, give them a good reason to to, to isolate so they uh, go back uh, out into public and they don't know how to like cross the street right it's like you're supposed to look both ways it's like huh yeah 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 for sure <laughs> um but steven man we've been talking a little bit longer than an hour man uh i would love to get you back on my show as well too um we can set that up yeah sure well we again. only just scratched the surface of uh of, of many of these topics was that a planet joke <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no pun intended but there we go uh where can people find you uh your website as well as your twitter handle um and email if you want to feel like putting that out there yeah so uh i have a website called stephenkane.net um they can also find me at the university of california riverside website um i have a twitter handle uh called exocytherian uh where that comes from is that um Cytherea is an ancient name for Venus, and Cytherean means re with respect to all things Venus. And so the exo is um, uh, referring to the fact that I look at, I, I study Venus as well as Venuses around other stars. And so they can find me on Twitter with, uh, with exo Cytherean. And I'll make sure I link it all in the description. I appreciate you for doing the podcast, and thanks for listening to this episode of God at the Blank.